Hey, what's good, jazz fans? Welcome to Jabber Jazz, your home for Utah jazz basketball content, always free of ads, from an analytical emphasis, and always with a fan's perspective as well. I'm your host, Adam Bushman. You can find me on Twitter at Adam underscore Bushman. And today we're diving into what I believe are the ideal targets for the Utah Jazz at picks 9, 16, and 28. I'm going to dive into what I like about these set of picks and who I might be targeting, what I like about them, uh, how I think they fit with the Jazz, and then what are kind of some of the odds that they're going to be available for the Jazz to pick at those respective spots. If you like what we're doing here at the Jabber Jazz podcast, uh, please give us a, a subscription. Uh, I encourage you to to subscribe to the podcast, to our YouTube channel as well. Perhaps leave a, a comment or even a review. That would help us reach even more Jazz fans like yourselves. And give us a follow on Twitter as well, at Jabber underscore Jazz. Well, without further ado, let's Jabber Jazz. All right, so let's dive into the targets I believe are some of the most ideal, based on my preferences, for the Utah Jazz at that number nine spot. So this is a is a tough spot. Uh, I actually engaged in in a little bit of uh, a discussion with uh, the Athletics Utah Jazz beat writer Tony Jones. Uh, a little bit about my perspective. Um, I, I feel that that the nine positions kind of right at the end of a tier uh, for for this draft. And when picking at the end of a tier, it's a little brutal because you are kind of left with whatever is left. You know, uh, say that we we went out to to buy a new car, and there were ten new cars of different makes and models. It's entirely possible that all of those are good, sound cars, but you'd likely want your choice. So if you were picking 10th out of a list of 10 people, that would be a brutal spot. Ideally, you would choose between three, maybe even four of the cars that that might be most suited to your preferences. That's kind of how I see it with, with this spot as well. I have my preferences, and so I would... I would like to choose, based upon those preferences, of among a handful of these prospects at the nine position. But given where we are, we're likely going to be left with whomever is left from the tier, and it's possible that the Jazz would even pick someone outside of that tier. So it's a little interesting from that perspective. But here are the here are the players that I would most like to be available around nine, and we'll kind of see what I like about them and how I think they fit with the Jazz, and currently where they're kind of mocked based upon some industry boards that I like to track. So first up is Jairus Walker. Uh, this guy is out of Houston. Uh, he's he's a really physically imposing guy. Um, you know he's he has one of the top BMI body mass index in this draft. Six foot seven without shoes. Seven three wingspan. Uh, the dude is just a physical. Uh, physical force of nature. It's really incredible. What I like about him the most are his passing skills. Didn't get to do it a ton at Houston, but when you saw flashes of it, it was some really high-level stuff. Going back to his high school tape, he demonstrated even more of his his ability to read the defense and to make his teammates open, capitalize on their movement as well. He's also a fantastic defender, really puts a lid on the rim. Uh, I kind of think he could be uh, just as uh, just as potent a rim protector as Draymond Green is, similar size. Uh, I, I think that Jairus is far superior athletically to Draymond. Um, Dream, uh, Jairus can get out and switch on the perimeter. He can be in some one-on-one -on -one situations. I don't think he'll be at the level of Draymond in those situations. But I do like his defense a lot. One of the highest uh, block plus steal rates, less the foul rate. Uh, he he did really well. He did really well in, in in that respect. So I think he also has enough creation, self-creation for me. He did a lot in high school. He did some at, at Houston, but I think that uh, I think that in certain situations. 
you know, late in the clock or maybe on some design plays or um, if he is kind of initiating some stuff, I think that his speed, athleticism, and frame can allow him to create off the dribble for himself and for others uh, in some limited opportunities. And maybe that even grows over time. I think there's some potential. I, I like the fit a lot. I think that there's a really exciting front court trio potential between Markinen, Jairus Walker, and Walker Kessler. Uh, I think those three would really fit nicely to each other. You know, you always have, uh, you know, an excellent rim protecting uh, player on the court. You always have some secondary rim defense. You've got, you know, some real, real positive length throughout that lineup. Uh, you've got now some excellent passing. You've got cutting. So I think you pretty much have everything. The one question is, do you have enough self-creation? We're hoping that Larry Markkinen continues to fine-tune some of that, takes on more responsibility. And I think that there's enough potential with Walker to where you probably are able to plumb enough out of those three positions. So uh, I, I really like that that trio pairing. Um, I think you're pretty elite defensively immediately last year the Jazz were right around average when Walker Kessler played and so if you add Jairus Walker to that front court I think we're top 10 defense immediately and potentially even more if you round out some of the other areas on defense um, I really like the idea of putting him in the pick and roll having him potentially operate at the nail that free throw line kind of how Bam Adebayo does and then in some situations, he can spot up in the corner, though that's not his biggest strength. So the range, what's what's kind of likely for, for Jairus? Right now, industry boards have him mocked between 4 and 8, so that would be narrowly missing the Jazz. In former iterations of tracking these industry boards, he has been down to 9 or 10. So there is still some fluidity there, but it's not incredibly likely he'll be available when the Jazz pick. Now let's talk Cam Whitmore. This is another guy that I really, really like. Uh, I think he is the ideal wing that everybody's kind of searching for. Uh, you look at him, he is elite athletically, and he's got a physically imposing frame to to match. Um, he, he really is just an absolute bulldog, and you could see it on his college and high school tape. You know, he just he just would not be denied when he put his mind and his um, and, and kind of got a full head of steam doing what he wanted. Um, I think he's got enough creation. I think you saw him do some stuff off the bounce, especially with the three point line, and also in some um, slightly leveraged positions against the defense. I thought you saw him uh, kind of get off the dribble, kind of weave in into the paint and kind of create his own shot there. So I think there's enough there immediately and gives some real good, exciting potential long-term. And I think he could really operate at either the two or the three. One of the interesting comps on him is Anthony Edwards, another uh, you know physically imposing frame, excellent athletically, and has really rounded out into an excellent, excellent player. Uh, got his first uh, All-Star game, I believe, last year. And so when you think about that, uh, I think that he fits in really, really well with the Jazz. He and Oshai Abaji can, can kind of bounce back and forth between two and the three, uh, match up against wings or some bigger guards. I think that takes a lot of pressure off Larry Markkinen, who is probably, in, at least in some situations, probably a little maxed at the three, especially on defense. And I think that takes a little pressure off, off him, and he can uh, be best as a, a really quick, long four, um, you know, who can, who can punish people who are a little slow of, of speed or even small for that position. Um, but uh, the Jazz needs some creation, and he ultimately kind of begins to fill that role. So that's why I think that the fit is, is really excellent. Also, the Jazz needs some athleticism, defense on the perimeter, and he provides some of those things. What's the range? So the industry boards kind of have him mocked between four and seven. So it's a bit tough as well. Um, we've seen previous iterations that have him falling to nine, but as more time has gone on, especially in the last two or three iterations that I've seen, uh, he isn't getting below seven, eight. So 
that's probably he's probably one of the most unlikely to be available at nine for the Jazz. But we know that Jazz have plenty of ammo for for trading up, so that that is still a possibility. And we have heard rumors that uh, Charlotte, Detroit, Portland, and Dallas are all interested in trading out of their picks. So there's some potential there. We'll see. So the third guy that I really like for this number nine spot is Osor Thompson. Um, Osor is one of the most athletic guys in the draft. He and his twin brother um, have just a really, really unique set of skills. Um, they have incredible feel and instincts for the game. They have incredible speed, athleticism. They're incredibly coordinated. Um, six six without shoes. Seven foot wingspans. And he's got a lot of balance across all the skills that you want. He's got excellent defense. He has a good, a pretty good handle and, and, and feel for the game. He's got a lot of wiggle. Uh, he, he moves off the ball very well. The big knock on him probably is his shooting and that he's not as good a passer as his brother Amen. I think the difference in the passing is pretty marginal. I, I think Asor is is really exceptional and is instantly becomes the best passer on the jazz if he's drafted here and on the shot i actually think he kind of projects as an average shooter i i don't really have the same concerns a lot of people do and the difference between uh, a sore's demonstrated shooting ability compared to his brother a man i think that's actually a pretty wide gap and so i really like a sore here um, I think the fit is excellent. Jazz needs speed, athleticism, and th that passing, I think, helps complement our finishers as well. Larry Markin, and, and that's going to be a theme for a lot of these players. I, I really want some, some high-level passing on this team because we have Walker Kessler and Larry Markinen who are both elite finishers. And those guys need two things. One, they need an advantage created that they can begin to exploit, and they need someone with excellent passing skills that can get them in positions within that advantage to capitalize. And so that's why I like Jairus Walker, excellent passer. That's another reason why a sore Thompson here really catches my eye because of, of that passing talent. And due to his quickness, his burst, his athleticism, I think he can kind of create some of those advantages and perfectly position our guys uh, with the passing uh, to where they can convert some of those really, really easy um, attempts. You saw as the year went on, it got a bit harder for Kessler and Markkinen to, uh, to score as efficiently and in as many elite spots because the best passer we had, Mike Conley, was traded. So... I think that there's some real real potential if we get some excellent passers on this team. Uh, maybe he even develops into a point guard of Sor Thompson. Uh, that is not out of the range of possibility. He has generally played wing, uh, and he moonlighted at point guard in in limited situations where he didn't play with his brother Amen. Uh, but there's there's a lot of indications that that perhaps he could develop there, and if he does, that that would be a monumental. A monumental development for the for the Jazz. Uh, six six seven foot wingspan point guard with that athleticism and that kind of balanced array of skills uh, would be would be absolutely phenomenal. So what's his range? Industry boards now have him between six and eight. It's rare occasion, but some have him falling to the late lottery in previous iterations. So he's probably one of the more likely out of those three, Walker, uh, Whitmore, and Asor Thompson. He's probably the most likely to be there at nine. It's tough because in most instances, he is being gobbled up by the Washington Wizards there at eight. Again, another reason why I said, in my opinion, I do have preferences for this tier, as I'm outlining here. And I would I would prefer to have a... The, the chance to pick from among some of the options and not be left with the last option in in the tier. But that that's my personal opinion. Okay, so the fourth guy I like for the ninth pick is Anthony Black. Anthony Black out of Arkansas. This guy is just, just phenomenal. I, I think he's probably like the best floor raiser 
uh, in this draft. I, I think he's just fantastic. Um, he's got incredible defense, and it's not always just about you know generating uh, positive activity with blocks, steals, avoiding fouls, but he's just always in great positions. Uh, I saw that even in the highest levels when Arkansas was playing uh, Kansas, I think it was in the round of 32. Uh, I think that's what it was. In the round of 32, he absolutely locked up Grady Dick and made him a zero factor in that game. And it wasn't at the expense of the rest of the defense, too. Sometimes you get players, and we've seen this with Hassan Whiteside um, and even Patrick Beverly, they get so, so intent on their single matchup that all of a sudden uh, you've eliminated that defender from participating in the hole, and defense is is a is a whole team activity, and so he was able to do both, which I thought was really really excellent. Again, awesome passer. Uh, he is really that connector. Uh, you know, he sets screens. Um, he can get into the teeth of the defense. He can get to the hole and finish. Uh, he can. Um, set other people up uh, I just feel like he's you know a great conductor out there and I think you really saw Arkansas flourish when he was out there conducting and connecting everybody as opposed to who, who everyone thought would be Arkansas's best player in Nick Smith Jr. So what what about his fit? Uh, I'm not as worried about the shot as some other people um, but assume that it doesn't quite come along we do need some more shooting talent, and ideally we would have Kessler hopefully uh, try to test some of his abilities and uh, from the three-point line um, to try to create long-term uh, positive spacing for Black. But again, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, I, I don't think that the worst-case scenario is all that likely uh, from a non-shooting standpoint, being Anthony Black. But his positional size is just excellent, 6'7". I uh, can't remember what his wingspan, but it is, uh, I think it's 6'10", uh, or 6'9". Anyways, I, th I think he is just, he's a fantastic player. I think you put him in the pick and roll with Kessler, or you have him hitting, marking in on cuts. His height, his length, um, and his kind of pedigree in this point guard space, I think would, would make for, for just an amazing pairing and really unlock some awesome things for our finishers. Uh, not a lot of creation, so that's still a, that is still a need long-term for the Jazz. We're, we're gaining a lot of fin play finishers, and we don't have as many play creators, uh, but I think Anthony Black is specifically tuned up to um, help uh, help accentuate built-in advantages by manipulating the defense and, and getting them Johnny on the spot to our guys. So industry boards have him mocked between 6 and 10. So there are some scenarios in which he's gone before the Jazz pick, but there there are some scenarios out there where he is uh, more than available for the Jazz at 9. All right, finally, the last player that uh, I like for this uh, number nine pick, uh, who, who is semi-realistic, right? Um, Scoot Henderson isn't falling. Uh, Brandon Miller isn't falling to nine. So these are semi-realistic options for the Jazz at nine. Uh, the last guy in this five is Taylor Hendricks for me. Uh, I really like Taylor Hendricks. And, and in that conversation with Tony Jones on Twitter, I didn't mean to come across as though I didn't like that the Jazz ended up with Taylor Hendricks. I, I think Taylor Hendricks is a fine player. But in my my ordered list of preferences in this tier, he's one of the latter. And so I personally would like the ability to choose from those that I have personal preferences higher. Generally, how I've gone about my tiers is saying that where there are tier differences, say tier 2 to tier 3, I feel pretty confident in the long term that the players in Tier 2 generally will be better than the players in Tier 3 as a whole. Now, there's no guarantees, and um, and I'm not predicting they, they will be, but that I feel more confident there. Within a tier, I can't say with any real confidence that any player will be better than another within the tier long term. 
but I have ordered them based on my personal preferences, which I would prefer to draft, uh, especially for the Jazz. So Taylor Hendricks, I can't say for certain that he's going to be better or worse than Asore Thompson, Jarris Walker, Anthony Black, or Cam Whitmore. But if we were on the playground and I had my pick of them all, Taylor would probably be my my last option out, out of those five. And if I ended up with him, I'd be content, uh, but I would would be disappointed I didn't get uh, some options. Anyways, enough about that. So what I like about Taylor Hendricks, uh, I think he's got that unique, that really unique pairing of elite three-point shooting and rim deterrence, rim defense. And that is just so, so valuable. I mean, we've seen it for years with with Brooke Lopez. Um, we've seen Miles Turner moonlight with some of that ability as well. And it really creates uh, impressive, impressive options that are really formidable on, on both ends. Um, so Taylor Hendricks can play the four. I believe he can moonlight at the five in some instances as well. S- similar to Jairus Walker on the Jazz, I think that's a really nice trio of Markinen, Hendricks, and Walker. I think those three complement each other really well. You always have primary defense. You can have secondary rim defense as well. Hendricks can switch out a bit on the perimeter. I'm not as confident with him as I was with uh, Jairus Walker. But also, I think he's an elite spot-up guy. Not as great a passer, not as great as a um, self-creator or a creator for others. But maybe there's some uh, to plumb there from potential. I also think he's got enough athleticism to kind of round that out nicely and, and, and be scalable for various matchups uh, on both ends. So, yeah, I think the fit is really nice with all those three. I think the one thing you lack is that self-creation. But, again, we're hoping that, that Markinen develops some of that. And um, hopefully, I'm not as confident as I am with Jairus really kind of uh, shouldering those creation responsibilities. But, but Taylor can do some. And, uh, and and it's not out of the range of possibility. So what is the range that Taylor Hendricks is going per industry draft boards? Right now he's going between 6 and 14. So that's kind of right at the heart of where the Jazz are picking. Um, in most instances, he's available when the Jazz pick. So of these five players that we got here, we've got Jairus Walker, Cam Whitmore, Anthony Black, Sore Thompson, Taylor Hendricks. Of these five guys, what are the odds that one of them is available at nine if we if we ran a draft simulation 500 times? Say, Well, I did so, and at least one of those five was available in all 500 simulations, so 100% of the time. That's, that's pretty great. That's pretty dang great. So... While I would like to have some of the options from above, these are my ideal five at that position, and I I can be pretty content that at least one of the five will be available for the Jazz. That doesn't mean, however, that the Jazz are are going to pick any of these five. And so while I do want to trust the Jazz in the front office, they know far more than I do about the players that are available. it is a nice feel. It is a nice feeling when your guy gets selected to the team. Doesn't mean that the future will be any brighter because they're the guys I like, and vice versa. Uh, just because the front office doesn't go with my players doesn't necessarily mean that they have any any brighter of a future either. So it's going to be a really really weird, but ex- exceptionally fun draft night for the Jazz upcoming. All right, let's move a little quicker here. Talking about the 16th pick and who are some of my preferred options for the Jazz there. Let's first talk Cason Wallace. This one is a bit of a stretch because we're hearing that he might have a pro, uh, he might have a promise from the Washington Wizards, which, which if in fact it happens, that increases the likelihood that one of the five that I've outlined for the number nine pick do indeed fall to the Jazz. But if Cason Wallace does slip um, in this draft a little bit, he would be just an excellent, excellent target for me at 16. Again, I think he's an excellent floor raiser. I think he does everything pretty well. 
He, I don't think he's got quite the star potential that you want, but in my opinion, at the point guard spot, in an ideal world, that would be uh, your floor raiser. Does a bit of everything, and on certain nights can have a star level game, but in general, they they perform complementary roles, doing a bit of everything that helps the team. Really, that connective tissue for the team, and ideally, it's at your wing positions where you're getting your volume scoring, most of your uh, creation, that kind of stuff. But uh, I, so I think Case and Wallace fits that just perfectly. Um, so what about the fit? Again, the lack of creation, not as much star potential, uh, isn't ideal. But again, I think at the point guard spot, that's probably that's probably you know where where you're most comfortable with it. I'd say. Um, I think that his his abilities and what he showed at Kentucky. Is, would just raise all the boats on the roster. I think he would scale with everyone that we have and most anybody we'd like to bring in as well. So uh, he doesn't have as much positional size, uh, but I think his, his you know, frame, his instincts are just, are just really elite. And the bill on him generally is that coaches are going to be begging front offices to take him. He is the ideal uh player that a coach would trust want to be out as many minutes as possible because good things just always happen when they're on the court. Okay, so what about the range? He's projected to go between 8 and 17. So, like I said, you know, there there are some signs that maybe he's not even available at 9, but he's got a pretty wide range here and there's there's some possibilities he's available at 16. A hope is that the teams right above us Oklahoma City, New Orleans, um, Toronto, and others may not have a big need for Cason Wallace's skill set. And so perhaps that, that means that he kind of falls to us. Also, Dallas at 10 likely isn't going with a point guard since they have Luka and are interested in bringing back Kyrie Irving. So there's at least some, some possibility there. All right, my second option here at the 16th pick, I really like Jalen hood Shafino. Jalen Hoshifino out of Indiana is another point guard. Um, I think his passing and defense is is really good and brings to the guard line and on the perimeter what I think are the two most desperate things we need right now. He's got the ability to punish drop coverage with his mid-range shooting. He's very slippery. He's very intentional. Um, He isn't exceptional at the outside shot, but uh, I think that there's... I think that there's more than enough shown there for him to be a little above average um, long term. He's got excellent size, a 6'4 without shoes, and a 6'10 wingspan. Um, again, looks to be just an excellent complimentary guy. He's got a lot of pedigree, went to Montverde Academy, played with Derek Whitehead. Um, so I, I think that the Jazz also don't really have many mid-range operators, and those who do, in my opinion, aren't the most efficient and aren't doing it in a way that helps the team. More so, it's kind of a, a last-ditch effort, or it's where they're comfortable. But I really see that Jalen hood Shafino could use it as a way to force drop bigs to come up on the screen. And with his passing and size, uh, I think that, that opens up some... Uh, unique opportunities for Kessler and Markin, and so uh, I, I think Hood Shafino would be a pretty good option for the Jazz. He's uh, he's mocked between nine and twenty-one, so again, perfectly positioned for the Jazz to scoop up at sixteen if they want. My third guy is yes, another point guard. Uh, Kobe Bufkin of Michigan is a guy I really like here. In fact, uh, Hood Shafino and Kobe Bufkin are back to back in my personal uh, draft rankings. Uh, what I like is that he met both the eye and the data test. You look at the data, flying colors. You look at the eye test, flying colors. He doesn't seem like he's got glaring weaknesses. He's got an excellent foundation, every skill you want. And I think he's not as natural a point guard as Hood Shafino, um, in my opinion. Still not as natural as Case and Wallace and others. I think he's more of a combo guard but if you draft him you likely want to see how much he can do as a point guard um 
but I think he does scale nicely with any roster. You bring in uh, or you trade for a point guard like, you know, say Luka Doncic or LaMelo Ball, a star like that. I think Kobe Bufkin can play off ball and really complement the rest of the team. Um, whereas if at nine you went with Cam Whitmore or something, and now we have Abaji, Whitmore, uh, Markin, and Kessler, uh, I, I think Kobe Bufkin could operate as the number one um, in that lineup and and do at least at least some of those point guard responsibilities well and perhaps scale. Uh, even better down the line. So industry boards have Buffkin going from 12 to 22, perfectly positioned at 16 if the Jazz want to want to take him. And if he doesn't fall, likely means someone is. Um, so for example, if he uh, if he went top 10, then uh, he's probably again not going to the Mavericks, um, and that kind of probably means that someone's falling to the Jazz there. Uh, and if not, then um, maybe even Taylor Hendricks starts slipping. So I like Kobe Bufkin with the my third uh, ideal or preferred option for the 16th pick. Let's talk Keontae George now. Uh, Keontae George has excellent pedigree. He played with Jairus Walker at IMG Academy. Has been just a phenomenal player for a long time. Went to Baylor. He had some injury issues throughout the year. And... But he still demonstrated just elite abilities creating with the ball, whether that was getting downhill to the cup, operating in the mid range, or creating his own shot from three. Uh, one of the one of the best elite shot creators makers from the draft. Um, I soured on him kind of towards the start of, and middle of the year, but as I've kind of exposed myself a little bit more to him and recognize that, hey, that creation piece is is really, really important around the league, and he's got um, such a smooth shot that that there's a lot of potential to scale really well there in the league. Um, industry boards have him going between 10 and 22. Again, he's one of the guys that had the most pedigree coming into the year you know he was ranked top six and so if the jazz could get him at 16 that would be just a heck of a win uh, for the team uh, and bring a lot of much needed creation uh, some on ball presence and he's got he's got an underrated amount of passing skills and i think if you put him alongside some elite finishers he's probably even more likely to to lean into that instead of always having to go after his own shot that may be some incredibly tough looks Though he's capable. All right, so my fifth option for the 16th pick is Bilal Koulibaly out of Metropolitan's 92, playing with Victor Wimbanyama. And honestly, one of the few players who is still playing, he and Victor are still playing in their uh, French league. What I like about him, he's, he's so incredibly fluid, graceful, coordinated, with or without the ball. You know, he just glides around the court, changes speed really nicely, adjusts angles. Um, he's, he's, really, he's got a really intriguing intersection of youth, coordination and athleticism, and phys- current physical tools. Uh, I believe, um, let me just double check, I believe he's six... Eight. Um, let me double check. Yeah, he's six eight without. Uh, he's six eight, seven two wingspan, already two hundred thirty pounds. Not even nineteen years old yet. Um, that that is really really intriguing uh, for the league, and it's one reason why he's starting to get mocked even higher and higher and higher. Uh, right now, he could be the draft still steal given how many boxes he's checking. Now, it's not without risk, and some are even talking about him having a promise in the lottery. Uh, The thought is that's probably Oklahoma City or Toronto. And we've also just heard reports from, I think it was Mark Stein, that the Jazz are considering Koulibaly with their ninth pick. In my opinion, that is a bit high. That's not the ideal I don't know, give and take of risk reward value proposition. That's not kind of the best balance of all those, in my opinion, at nine. But at 16, it would be a really, a really nice option there. 
So Bilal Koulibaly, uh, industry boards have him between 11 and 33. So how often, in how many situations would any of those five, at least one of those five, um, Kaysen Wallace, Jalen Huchifino, Kobe Bufkin, Keontae George, or Bilal Koulibaly, in how many situations are one of those five available? Well, I ran 500 simulations, and at least one was available in 500 of them, 100%. It would be awesome if we got one of those guys. Now, the tough thing is if we went with a point guard like Anthony Black, a lot of my targets here at 16 are also point guards. So, for example, I don't think Jalen hood Shafino would be an ideal pairing with Anthony Black. I would prefer Kobe Bufkin or even Kaysen Wallace. But if we went point guard with Anthony Black, I I would even probably see to you know looking at Keontae George or Bilal Koulibaly instead. So that's where there is a little bit of dependency. I I would prefer not to stack a ton of positions, especially since we already have a little bit of talent at various positions. Um, and so I'd like to cast the net a little wide uh, and just kind of err on that positional size and and see how things kind of scale and evolve over time. Um, but those are kind of my opinions and targets for the 16th pick in the draft. All right, so let's now talk about draft targets at the 28th pick. So here the number one guy on my list is Derek Whitehead. Uh, Derek Whitehead out of Duke, he was the, I believe, number two or number three uh, ranked recruit via ESPN out of high school, went to Montverde Academy, a really, really elite shooter, demonstrating it both in high school and college. In college, he was a little bit more standstill, um, but he did it from, in my opinion, some further distances, more difficult uh, situations, more high leverage moments. But as a high school player, he had a pedigree of self-creation, athleticism, um, a, a lot. He, he was really ball dominant. Uh, even next to Jalen Huchifino. So perhaps that even indicates that Huchifino can get off ball more than than we saw at Indiana. But I think the fit with the Jazz is excellent. I think he's got a great floor, but he's also got some ceiling that hasn't been plumbed. At Duke, he was really pigeonholed into a complementary role, and a lot of that was his injuries early, and he is having his second foot surgery of the offseason, though... All indications are that he's going to be more than ready for opening day in the NBA. So there is still some some risk there, but he's uh, one of the youngest players in the draft. He's already uh, got that pedigree in high school. Um, there are explanations for why he didn't demonstrate everything he did in high school in college, but he showed where he is still elite. So I think there's a really unique combination of, of high floor and high ceiling with Dariq. Industry boards have him going between 16 and 35. Honestly, if you told me that we got him at 16, I'd, I'd still be pretty pleased. Um, given the, the foot surgeries, it's not my ideal intersection of, of value, risk, reward, that type of thing. But at 28, uh, he's can't miss, in my opinion. If he's there, take him, no questions asked. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's uh, Derek Whitehead, mocked between 16 and 35. All right, my next guy is Gigi Jackson, one of the uh, more controversial guys in the draft. Uh, he's an elite self-creator, um, one of the youngest guys in the draft. But again, like Koulibaly, um, he's got youth. He's got some really great measurables. Um, he's got good athleticism. And again, that self-creation for as young as he was on as bad a South Carolina team as he was in as strong a conference of the SEC that he was, he was able to generate any shot he wanted. And it wasn't on the greatest efficiency, but I, I really buy those traits. Now we are hearing that he's interviewed poorly, uh, the maturity isn't there, some of that stuff. It is concerning, don't get me wrong. But at 28, I'm willing to gamble. I am absolutely willing to gamble. And that you put him with a, a strong, 
motivational, care about you, tough love type coaching staff that we have with players who are obviously better than him um, right now. And in a situation in Utah where I think that maturity can can come and he's kind of insulated from some of some of the um, some of the stuff that around the NBA that can foster immaturity and um, and some of those things that aren't as constructive for the player themselves and the team. I think some of that stuff can be curbed. I think he's the ideal to three to surround our guys. Again, we have two elite finishers in the front court, Kessler and Markinen. Right now, we have an excellent shooter, in my opinion, in Abaji, who's shown a little bit of, of you know, potential to to drive and attack closeouts, and we have a mishmash of point guards. I think he's the elite three with all that self creation ability and that youth. I think he's the the perfect three to add to to our squad, but. Some of those risks that we've mentioned uh, is why at 28, he's a great play. At 16, I would still do it. I would still grab him at 16, but I get the hesitation. Um, I I used to say also that I, I would even go so far as 9, to grab him at 9. The stuff that we're hearing on some of that immaturity side uh, and interviewing poorly um, has had me convinced that, that he's not – the right value play at nine but industry boards have him between 16 and 33 so there's some there's some good indications that he could be around at 28 for the jazz all right the third guy that i like for this 28 spot is maxwell lewis i think he's got really really nice size and for that size he's got a lot of really nice ease ease of movement uh, he didn't rate out exceptionally well in the athleticism or coordination activities at the combine, but from the eye test, I I really like like the way he moves on the court for his size. Uh, he's got enough ball handling, he's got enough shot creation, and um, and enough defensive instincts to where everything is kind of kind of balanced. He's got a foundation in everything. Again, another three that I think would mesh really well with Laurie. Um, he can be off ball and shoot. He can provide a little bit of defense, um, and there's some potential there. But then he's he's demonstrated some creation on a bad Pepperdine team. Um, so I really like Maxwell Lewis here at 28. Uh, he's routinely mocked between 15 and 30 in the draft um, per some of these industry big boards. Next up at four for me in my preferred list of targets at 28 is Colby Jones out of Xavier. I love this guy. Uh, I think he's a great floor raiser. Um, I think he does a l- everything. I think he does everything pretty well. Um, passing, defense, shooting. I think he's, you know, a great example of what the Thinking Basketball book talks about: portable players, players with skill sets where. You can have a lot of those skill sets, and it translates well. It's hard to have a lot of people who need the ball in their hand. It's hard to have a lot of people who are good at isolation. It's not very hard to have a lot of people that are excellent passers or a lot of people who play uh, defense uh, or a lot of people who can, who can shoot. So that's why I think that he, he's very portable. And I think he's kind of the the model that Boston has looked for in their guards, in Marcus Smart, in um, Malcolm Brogdon, Derek White. I think he's perfectly in in that mold, and I I think he could be really excellent. Um, and meshes nicely with kind of any guard, in my opinion. Um, perhaps he he could even you know transition to you know a real point guard role. Um, he did operate with the ball a lot in the half court with Xavier. So he's routinely mocked between 19 and 48. That 48 is a little bit of an outlier. A single board had him there. Um, but more than available for the Jazz at 28 in all likelihood. And finally, the fifth player that I like for 28 is Andre Jackson of UConn. Uh, a little bit older, uh, not a really strong shot. Uh, but excellent defense, excellent passing. Again, I think he's that winning mindset player, brings winning impact, great connector. Um, I think he's got enough shooting talent already that 
you know, you might be able to clean up a little bit of form. I think he's got enough confidence in it already to where he could be just a little bit below average. Um, so you do worry a little bit in some lineups that we don't have enough shooting there. But, uh, but if our backup five is a shooting five, so say we get Taylor Hendricks at nine, uh, I think Andre Jackson works really well here at 28, um, especially in some of those backup roles. I think you can have him uh, be a really nice player next to um, the shooting center that we have. And so now he can shoot, uh, but you aren't, you aren't dependent on um, teams just leaving him open and then the offense breaking down in the half court. So I really like Andre Jackson here. Um, the industry boards mock him between 31 and 49, so he's he'll be there at 28. Um, I really like Andre Jackson. I, I think he's one of the big reasons that that UConn was so successful. His defense, passing, that that those connective instincts, I think was an invaluable component to that UConn team. All right, so how often is one of these five? Dariq Whitehead, Gigi Jackson, Maxwell Lewis, Colby Jones, or Andre Jackson. How often are one of those five available at 28? Well, ran 500 simulations, and again, in 500, um, at least one of them were available. So now, let's think holistically. We've got five options at 9, five preferences at 16, and five at 28. How likely is it that one of those five for nine is available and one of those five at 16 is available and one of those at 28 are available. Well, I ran 500 simulations again and in 99% of those, you were able to select one of those five at the respective spots. So pretty, pretty awesome. Again, it doesn't mean that the Jazz are going to go with any of those guys, but those are my preferences. I think it addresses the most important and, and desperate needs that the Jazz have, which are passing and defense. Third of which is self-creation. I think it's harder at the number nine pick to get self-creation. That's why I am a fan of trading up for players who bring more of that self-creation. However, um, I think passing and defense are more than... Uh, more than abundant at 9, 16, and 28. And I think they would do a lot to help uh, Larry Markin and Walker Kessler be their best and also elevate the Jazz defense from uh, a really poor showing when Walker Kessler wasn't on the court last year uh, to what could be a top 10 defense if we get the right pieces in. So some someone on Twitter asked me, what is my ideal on a draft night look like here? Uh, I would probably say that my ideal is Jairus Walker at 9, uh, Jalen Hood Shafino at 16, and then Dariq Whitehead at 28. I think that gives you a lot of shooting, a lot of passing, a lot of defense, and you've got some, some good floor players, and then there's some ceiling to plumb with Dariq Whitehead and Jairus Walker that could be really, really intriguing. I think that'd give you a top 10 defense immediately, and I think that um, if Abaji takes a little bit of a leap and if Markin develops some self-creation as well, uh, I think that could be, that could be a, really, a really exciting team. I don't know that that translates to wins immediately, but I think that would be a really exciting team, giving you a lot of a lot of hope for the future, and would give you also a lot of ammo in the in the coffers to uh, put together perhaps a star trade uh, this season uh, or in preparation for the 2024 off season. Well, thanks so much for joining me. I hope that you're getting as as excited about the NBA draft as I am. I've never prepared this much for an NBA draft, and so it'll be a real treat on draft night to digest the whole process and uh, experiment with how, how things are shaking out. And this is a good time to tell you that I'll be live streaming the draft on YouTube and, hope, and hopefully doing it on Twitter as well. So I'd really encourage you to have the, have the draft 
uh, up on on the TV, sound down, and listening to the live stream. I'm going to be having a guest, and we're going to be reacting to the picks, talking strategy as the draft is unfolding, and also reacting to the Jazz picks, explaining our boards and and where things kind of stand. So come join me and my guest. It's going to be pretty uh, pretty low key and just reacting to the draft from a little bit of an analytical emphasis, no ads, and again a fan's perspective. So thanks for joining me. Follow us at Jabber underscore Jazz on Twitter. And as always, as is customary here, we're going to leave you with the sounds of jazz. (laughs) 